and welcome to the Deep Dive on the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com. I'm your host, and with me as always are the Deep Dive gentlemen, Ian Boyd, Paul Waddlington, always bringing uh, the, the news and, 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 the, and the word at InsideTexas.com on X's and O's and everything in between. Please like our video and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Help us get to that 7,000 mark. We're continuing to climb. Also, use the promo code IT1, and you get two months of InsideTexas.com for a dollar. We are literally giving away the best information on the market. Get on it. IT1 for two months of Inside Texas for a dollar. Today's subject is the depth. We're going to go in-depth on depth. And I took that from a from one of the stories that Mr. Paul Waddlington posted yesterday talking about just what the program looks like from a from a larger standpoint from a from a macro level because the you know the first thing I noticed when we went to practice a couple of weeks ago was the numbers. There's just there's so much there's so much so many guys there that can contribute. There's so many guys that can be on it too deep. And I think that's going to help Sark. We're going to go over the pros and cons of both and and kind of break down a little bit from positions. And so um, we're going to start off on, uh, on, on on position. What positions do we want depth? We'll go on the offensive side. Obviously, you want depth at, at most spots, but we're going to make this a little a little bit more integral. OK, so I'm going to give it to Paul. What tell me about these positions of, of depth on offense and, and what's the importance? Well, I think the answer is you want position. You want depth everywhere. Uh, but right. I think the question is, where is playable depth? Um, we we obviously have some quarterbacks that we like, uh, good quarterback room, even with the transfer out of Malik Murphy to Duke. Uh, the early word on Trey Owens and some of the guys who are running third and fourth team is, is positive as well. Of course, you have Arch Manning waiting to be handed the reins by Quinn Ewers. Uh, is it realistic to alternate your quarterback, right? So depth at quarterback becomes meaningful with injury, frankly. It's not a, a position typically where any coach wants to platoon uh, unless you just have very contrasting styles of quarterback. And typically in that scenario, one of those quarterbacks is really incomplete, right? You have the running quarterback who can't throw. You have the throwing quarterback who can't use a, you know, immobile in the pocket. And you want to unlock some aspect of your offense. That's not the situation Texas has. So Texas has good depth at quarterback. But we don't want to really see that depth uh, if we can help it. The more interesting question, and this is where I want to pitch it to you gentlemen, and, and especially Ian, is wide receiver. Texas and Sark, uh, under Sark, I should say, typically wants a tight wide receiver rotation. And the reason for that is because he wants coherence in the passing game. He wants everyone to know where they're going. He wants guys to get a bunch of reps doing what they do. And he wants it to be a machine, right, in the passing game. So the big battle in the offseason is for playing time. Because if you're a starter at wide receiver at Texas, you're playing 50, 60, 70 snaps. There, there's right. no rotation. Other schools have a different philosophy. You, you, you play six guys over the course of a game. And your starters play two-thirds of the snaps. Your, your backups play a third. It looks like Texas has really good depth potentially at wide receiver. How does Texas play that hand? Does Sark change some of that? Throw it to you, Ian. Is he going to change his philosophy? Or is it your starters play all the snaps and the other guys can sit and wait their turn? I think it's going to be wait their turn. That's how he's typically done it. Um, usually when the guys with really high-level passing games usually don't want to rotate the receivers a ton for one of two reasons. Like you could be of the Mike Leach school where your, you, your receivers have very loose instructions and it's like, get open, but you're going to get open in sync with your quarterback. And he's going to get used to you being open in certain parts of the field against certain coverages. And you guys are going to be like, you know, pick and roll partners, just changing it up every time. Then there's guys like Sark that tell the receivers like at 10 yards on this route, you're going to execute this footwork. You're going to break open here because the spacing and the, and the timing has all been calibrated with scientific tools. And it's going to be that way every time. And that's the way that maximizes. And that's where the quarterback is going to throw it. And you're going to be there. You're going to be on the bench. Right. And so they, he really likes developing like precision in that way. Um, so, I mean, they have a lot of guys that, they're going to want to play and they're going to want to keep around. 
But I think Cirque might just, you know, at the end of the day, he has this pitch where he can say, I can get three or four of you guys good numbers. And if you are not one of those three or four guys, these other dudes are going to be gone in the NFL. And then next year it's you. So just trust me and, and I'll make good on this. Kind of like he did. He has a, a quarterback as well. That's been kind of his MO at quarterback over the last 20 years. Like, you know, uh, Br- Bryce Young sit for a year behind Mac Jones. It's going to be all Mac Jones this year, but it's going to be worth it when you take over in the next year. I think that's going to be how he does it with receiver. Wingo maybe in particular is really going to stress that because he's such a talented freshman. But yeah, other than that, I don't know. Well, and and Wingo's a different body type, right? He he has a different set. He has a different set of skills, if I may quote Liam Neeson. So, <laughs> Justin, let me pitch it to you. We'll give a little devil's advocacy on Ian's take because that seems to be Sark's mo. I mean, it's inarguable. Yes. But we brought in three transfer receivers, and these guys are all expecting to start or at least play very significant roles. And then you have very talented guys waiting. Uh, for their opportunity in DeAndre Moore, John Tay Cook. What if two things, and of course, true freshman Ronnie Wing, uh, uh, Ryan Wingo, I was going to say Ronnie Wingo, his dad. Uh, two things then. What if these guys can learn their roles and execute what they're supposed to do when they're out on the field? And you, you've got six playable guys. And then secondly, Sark has never had to deal with effectively a wide open transfer portal and NIL and other schools whispering in the ears of your players, might he have to change some of his philosophy and and have a little bit of a wider span of play at wide receiver? Or is he just telling these guys, hey, if you want to play, your opportunities in the spring and the fall, show up and take your job and you're going to be the guy. I I, I think that I almost feel like it can be a little of both for, 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 for this reason. He didn't have this depth the first few years in Austin. You know, after Worthy, Mitchell, and Whittington, it fell off pretty hard. There wasn't a lot of real, you know, real reliable guys coming up behind those guys. When you go to the portal, and I tell people this all the time, they didn't transfer to sit. They, they, their expectation, like you said, they think they're going to start or they think they're going to play a lot. That's why they came to Texas was to get in this offense and to get productive so you can get to the NFL, to the next level. And so I think he's going to have to massage that a little bit. I think because, one, Wingo has done enough to where he's going to merit, like 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 Ian said, this is going to stretch that philosophy. But, two, you know, you've got Matthew Golden. You've got Silas, Bol- Silas Bolden, who's not even on campus yet. That's another guy that's going to try to factor in to, to what they're doing, whether it's a slot role, whether it's a Keelan Robinson gadget back role. Either way, you know, something of that sort. It's one of those things where, you know, one, it's incredible for, for injuries because if somebody does go down, next man can just step right up. Last year, if one of those two guys goes down, that that was a hole in the offense. Now, granted, you had Sanders, you had Brooks, you could, you could mix it up, but – I think he gets a little – I think he opens it up a little bit more. I I think instead of just running a a starting five in basketball, he's going to give us a sixth man. I think there might even be a seventh man. After that, I don't think you're going to have guys seeing the field. I think you could have an extra one or two, maybe even three, depending on who does what. But someone's going to get left out. And we know wide receivers can be kind of in the diva category. And so there could be a little bit of – a little bit of struggle there, but I think he's going to try to, to, to open it up a little bit. I feel like he's always going to say, hey, that's what the spring and summer are for and fall camp to figure it out if you want to play. But he didn't have the depth he has this year like he's had in the previous years in Austin. And so I think he has to change his philosophy. And look, he'll be the first one to tell you, sometimes I, I you know, I change things. Sometimes I take things from other coaches. Sometimes I, I, I take a, a different angle to maybe this will make us better. And when you've got two golden arms in Quinn and Arch, you know, listen to them. Arch Manning feeds Ryan Wingo in practice. He tells him that. He says, are you ready to eat? Because I'm going to feed this bleeper. And, 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 and so there's also that dynamic. Some of these quarterbacks are getting closer. Arch and Jante have a strong connection. Arch and DeAndre Moore have a connection. And I think that's also part of it too. There's so many things to this. I think you have to kind of 
go look back and go, okay, we, we can change a little bit, but we're going to keep the way we're going to keep our mindset. But I, I think there's has to be a little bit of change guys. Yeah. You know, it's not unusual for your second team quarterback to have connections with the second group of receivers, right? I mean, that's absolutely. Common. So Quinn starting just to be clear for anyone listening to Justin's ruminations there. Um, no question. Yeah, I think, so let me throw out we're wide receiver. Maybe we're indeterminate. We're not fully sure what Sark's going to do. The easy thing to do is say he's going to pick his three, maybe his four at most, and he's going to feed those guys. But there is an argument that he could expand that rotation out to five, possibly six. Here's two positions I'm going to throw out where I think because of the nature of the position, it's difficult to play a lot of guys and shuttle a bunch of guys. And then another position where once you have a certain level of trust, coaches will play a bunch of guys, and that's running back and offensive line. The running backs, I think it's pretty clear. Jaden Blue and Cedric Baxter are going to be 1A and 1B, and you can arrange that in whatever order you'd like. But we keep hearing good things about a number three back, potentially, and that's Trey Wisner uh, or maybe one of these freshmen. Uh, do we do? Are there any downsides to playing a lot of backs if they know their basic job, uh, or can you just kind of mix and match what you want from the running back based on what you need from the offense at that moment? We know we're going to play two guys a lot. Are we going to play three a little bit as well, or do you think you're going to be mostly two guys? Now, Sark Sark does like to have one main volume back. His thousand yard guy, he calls it. I don't I don't know if that's just a recruiting thing. Or if it's like a, I want one guy to have a feel for how to get yards and make reads against a given defense, right? Like I want one guy that's going to consistently make winning choices with his cuts and whatever. But beyond that, I mean, Sark was also the guy that was uh, presiding over the Reggie Bush, Lindale White, ultimate thunder lightning combo of college football. And he's consistently recruited to have basically that, right? They yeah. always make sure that campus has like almost like a three deep of both the power volume back and the, you know, gadget versatile speed back. So you could almost go like a uh, Baxter, uh, maybe red. We'll see on that guy, Clark and or Gibson, right. Is one three deep. And then the other one, uh, blue Wisner and we'll see. Right. So I definitely think that that's the plan. Um, I, w- I wonder if there's like a little more consistency with third down. Like is Jaden Blue consistently the third down guy? Or is there even mix and match there? Because it's like, hey, Baxter can protect. And I don't know. They have all, he has a, <laughs> Sark has a lot of options there. And he's, he's kind of created versatility for himself with how he does things. So O-line, I think probably no other position on the field in football you need more continuity guys need to play together they need to understand what the other guy is going to do they all have to be on the same page they've all got to be you know five fingers forming a fist and if they can't if you've got one finger off not your middle finger we're on youtube uh then you're, you're gonna have problems right so i think we know that there's a battle for the starting positions i think we know who the favorites are uh but We've got some good depth here on the offensive line. And O-line, contrast the Divas at wide receiver, they tend to be a little more patient, but not that patient. And NIL and transfer portals are are shaping and going to change how they view things. So is there an argument for rotating these guys and and playing a bunch of of snaps and alternating snaps at certain positions? Or do you need to find your five and stick with it? And if you if you have a transfer or two because of it, so be it. That's how it is, and you develop the next line. I, I say well, go. I was just going to say, Ian, find your five. Find your five that you can that you can glue in with that right there. Your five. But what you said, go ahead, Ian, because what Paul said, the depth there. I think that's that you don't need to rotate a ton on the offensive line. I think them playing more snaps, there's stats that come out that tell you when teams have offensive linemen that start and and, and that are consistently starting and consistently in a game and the, they, they, their offenses run better. The, the, it's a better play, less less penalties on the line. Like there's something to that. Ian, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, the same. I mean, 
the offensive line has to be they, they have to be ready to defend together and to attack together. Like your pass protection and, and communication and cohesion and like trading off pass rushers is like a level beyond the coordination that you need at most other positions together on the field. And then that's like, like 60% of the equation, 60, 65%. The other is run blocking together, which is also more complicated than the level of cohesion required at other spots. So, um, yeah, I think another benefit of the transfer portal is that, like, if you have guys that are going to leave after they lose, you can always backfill later in the portal. Like, grabbing a transfer from, like, the G5 level or even another Power 5 school that maybe even has starting experience is very feasible at Texas, right? Like, can, like a Calvin Anderson. Yeah, or, you know, even... There's, there's probably another level even beyond that that you can go. Um, there's, so there's just no point. It's kind of like receiver. I, I think both of those positions, with very few exceptions, like you really don't want Ryan Wingo to transfer, right? You really wouldn't want Kelvin Banks or probably like Trevor Goosby to transfer. Like a guy that's going to be like an NFL difference maker. Everywhere else, though, get your five, and if someone doesn't like it, you can probably find his replacement in the portal. Or you could find his, you know, Flood finds his replacement on the recruiting trail. Just look at the last three classes they've signed, guys. They're not bringing yeah. in any portal offensive linemen. They're trying to develop these guys. They're trying to do it in home, in house. And I'll tell you who else is good at, at developing in home and in house. And that's Andre the lawyer. You know, if you're ever injured, this is the guy you've got to call, guys, at 214 444 8808. Slip and falls, on-the-job accidents, 18-wheeler accidents, wrongful deaths. I mean, Andre has you covered. He's a longtime Inside Texas reader, but he will help out anybody in any way. He's located in the Dallas area. Give him a call whenever you get in a spot. Get him a call whenever you're in trouble. 214-444-8808. That's Andre the lawyer. We know that he's like five offensive linemen. He's going to play together. and He's going to help you out. He's going to protect you. He'll be your left tackle if you need him. Um Let's slide over to the defensive side where I think it's it can be a little more interesting because with defense, you got to think about reps and keeping guys fresh and keeping them healthy. And like on the defensive line, Texas was notorious the last couple of seasons of starters getting 20, 25 reps a game just to keep those guys fresh. And they've had the depth to rotate in. I'm going to pivot back to you. This is your call, on uh, uh, Paul, rather. Um what are you seeing in the positions of depth on defense? So we see pretty good depth everywhere on the defense. We see really good depth in the secondary and on the edge, which how things can change in a year, right? We're, we're thinking about edge candidates. What are we going to do on the edge last year or, or the year before? Or 2021, it was really grim, right? We're we're going after third stringers at other programs to come, come in and, and – potentially start for us on the edge. And we're, we're out of the, those woods now. If you look at the, the roster and Feels frankly, like the, different, the different types of bodies on the edge, the different types of play styles. So we can actually match some of our personnel groupings and our rotations based on who the opponent. Like, you know, we want to have some quickness out there and some chasers who are going to run someone down. We got Trey Moore and Colin Simmons. If we need to be a little stronger against the run, but still also be to rush the passer, we might roll out Burke and Sorrell at the same time. It's possible. So they have a lot of options, a lot of interesting stuff they can do out there. It makes sense in general to rotate your defensive line because you want those guys going like their hardest. Yes. And if you have the ability to do that, you want hockey line shifts just constantly. Because theoretically, if you call the defense correctly, that should give you a big advantage late in the first half and late in the second half when teams are stealing scores, frankly, or even just a long drive. Sometimes your defense has to weather a 13 play series, right? Whatever the result, maybe you hold them, maybe they get a field goal, maybe they score a touchdown at the end of it. But after that 13 plays, you're the players that were stuck out there. If the other team was running tempo, they're winded. It's really <laughs> nice. If you have a quick three and out on offense, to actually put out fresh faces. So we have seen Texas rotate on defense. We have seen fresh faces. On the D-line, it's not particularly arguable. Unlike the offensive line, 
there's no needed cohesion there. There's a couple of things they need to understand working together, but mostly those guys, the linebacker behind them who, who does know what to do, or at least one of them, you hope, is going <laughs> to go up and tap one of them on the butt and say, no, no, get over there. Right? Slide over. Slide over. Come on, dummy. We got over this, right? <laughs> what Texas did do, and I did bring this up during the year, pros and cons, is we played a lot of guys in the secondary. There are obvious pros to that. These guys run around a lot. These guys um, also benefit from being fresh. There are serious cons to that, which is like wide receiver, being the mirror of the wide receiver position, they need to understand how to play together. The only other group that plays together more on a football field is the O-line. And the DBs are the O-line of the, of the secondary in terms of being able to play as a group. And if they can play as a group and really understand what the other is doing, they can actually play above their ability level as a, as a group. Just like when you have a bunch of six-year offensive linemen who are all 24. Yeah. And none of them are getting drafted. But that's a force in college football because they all operate in, in this just mass of, of bodies and train jobs and they have the timing down and they have, oh, I'll hold them for just this amount of time before I bleed out. Same thing with DBs. If they play together and they understand the scheme, they can play above their ability level. And it happens all the time. Michigan had talented defensive backs. They also never took them out of the game. Interestingly, Whenever they started with, that's what they finished with. And no other dudes were coming in. Now, interestingly, they did have some depth. And depending on the opponent play style, they would start a different safety. So they had a really big run-stopping safety. This dude who's like 6'3". I'm blanking on his name. Maybe Ian remembers. Uh, Sob, maybe. Yeah, it was a big hitter. When they played Washington, they're like, hey, man, we understand you started 10 games for us this year, but this ain't your game. And they put in a little coverage guy. So, uh, but once they made their rotation, I mean, they they put in their guys, not their rotation. Those guys stayed on the field. They didn't come off the field. Whereas up front, Michigan's defensive line was rotating every four plays, just constantly. Linebackers, similar deal. So my question is, Texas has good depth in the secondary. We've got a bunch of guys. We've got interesting athletes. We've got experienced guys. We've got some guys who've not taken the next step. We've got other guys that everyone's really excited about that we think are going to take the next step. Do I think we're all co-signed on you want to play a bunch of D-line, right? Yeah. Yes. Do we want to rotate in the secondary? Because there were times last year when it didn't look so great in terms of them all being on the same page. Or is it everyone levels up with another year in the program, another year in the scheme, and we can still play eight guys in the secondary and and we'll be fine. Or do we need to cut down that rotation and just say, Hey, the starters are the starters. I would like to split the baby just a little bit. Like, um, yeah, King Solomon over here in 2022. You just want to wound the baby. I just want to wound the baby in 2022. It's fair. (laughs) They, uh, they ran into big problems because they didn't have like 2021. They drove everyone crazy. They had like co-starters. It felt like everyone was moving all the time and nobody was doing that well, right? 2022, they were actually much more like, these are our guys. But they had big problems. Like against Oklahoma State, Jaron Thompson played like 90 snaps or something. And they were just exhausted. And the secondary was like blowing out wheels left and right. And they he got play 103 in- snaps against Texas Tech that year as well? Maybe. I mean, they, they got into big trouble with – Lack and they of converted depth. like seven fourth downs or something. Oh yeah, they they yeah. just they had guys getting hurt and then they were struggling with depth, it, it, like mid season until they had like a bye week to kind of bandage things up. I think that having rotations is okay. Like I understand the rationale and I, I support it to a point, but the, to the extent where they have basically have had like co starters in the secondary, I don't think is good. I would like every third or every fourth series, you want to get the backups in. So your starters are fresh later. If you're playing a team like Tennessee or Mississippi state or Oklahoma, who's going to try to make you defend like 80 to a hundred snaps. Then I get it in those cases. Yeah. 
but I, I'm with Paul on that. I want to, I would rather see clear starters that are playing 80% of the game, at least together. And I think that would be like an improvement over how they did it last year and, and closer towards like say Michigan. Can you give me the five, your five that you felt you feel like would be that best? Because I think we understand corner and nickel, but what about safety? Because there's got to be room for Makuba. Michael Taff has not given up any ground. Derek Williams can't leave the field. Like Jelani McDonald's making plays. What, what what would you feel like is that that so- solid five? I mean, I'd like to see him. I kind of think it's going to be um, Barron in the corners. Barron, Brooks, Muhammad, probably. Um, I'm still curious about Barron at corner. And that could maybe solve some problems that I'm about to get into. But barring that, barring that, I think it's I think it's Taff and Williams, and Makuba is rotating. It's maybe I haven't seen them, so it's possible Makuba is better than Williams. But I I think this is going to drive people crazy. But I think Taff is going to end up being one of the best, just because of the. Like the things Paul was talking about earlier, like when you have guys that play together on a string, they play above their level. And Taff is going to be most likely to contribute to that kind of group project effort than the others. And he's also, he might be like the hardest hitter and maybe the best tackler of the bunch. Maybe not because Williams is kind of, it might be Williams, but it it might also be Taff as as crazy as that is for like a walk. If they had a, if this was, if they had a science project, Taff would be the guy that you put all the work on. It's like, okay, okay, we'll we'll help out with this. We'll help out with that. But you're going to write it, right? But you're going to build it and put it on. We'll just kind of follow your lead. Taff, Taff is that valuable in this spot. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I, we're going to have to see how that shakes out. I think yeah. there's a lot of <laughs> options. We could have Makuba as our starting nickel. Um, we could, There's a world where Jalen Gilbo is starting at nickel. The dude <laughs> is playing Aaron phenomenal. Gilbo. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, One thing about playing a lot of plays on defense, and this is always my retort to people who say, our offense needs to hold the ball. The defense is getting worn out. The defense has a vote. If you don't want someone to run 100 plays, get a three and out. (laughs) Stop them on fourth down. Don't let them convert seven fourth downs, Justin. So, you know, and part of the reason that was happening is because the group wasn't playing coherently. They weren't all on the same page. So it's kind of an interesting, if you want to talk about first principles and causation of a team running 100 plays on you, well, it's because your defense isn't getting stops. It's not just because your offense refuses to, you know, have 20 play drives of their own. It's because your defense can't get them off the field. So whatever gets the defense off the field is what you should go with. Uh, And that's, that's, I think, going to be the interesting challenge. Now, are there certain offenses that they're just going to hit on a drive and you're going to get worn down? You need to be able to play other guys? Yes. Uh, and at the same time, we kind of use the, the, D, the DBs holistically. But the truth is you can probably alternate your corners or your nickels a little more easily depending on your coverage schemes and the opponent than your safeties because look we saw again and again last year when keaton crawford went in the game he was targeted yes particularly in play action play action deep we saw guys run like across his face wide open and catch a touchdown and crawford's just standing there watching uh and that was not by accident right so corner a little bit more instinctive position you still need to understand the larger defense and your role in it but if Manny Muhammad is phenomenal, if Jade Barron's phenomenal, if Terrence Brooks turns the next page, yeah, you, know, you could credibly play three guys at corner and, and get that sort of rotation. So I, I don't know is, is the answer. Um, I have pretty strong feelings on the other positions and how you can rotate or not. DB, I'm kind of wait and see. What about y'all? Yeah. Well, let me let me also say like one of the things that would be kind of crazy last year would be when they would rotate everyone together yes it's like maybe if you really want to get your other dbs in 
don't do it when you're also putting in the backup. The other backups to the other spots. Exactly. Yeah. I, exactly. I think they, yeah, I think they, they usually did, but there, I think there was like one game where they did not. And it was like, you're just giving away a possession. And they ended up having to bring the starters out before the end of the drive to try to, you know, limit the damage. And then it just. Well, Ian, in, in the NBA, they learned that over time that your second rotation that replaces the starters that play a good portion of the first quarter, right? You still need to keep a starter out there who's your scorer. Yes. Because, you know, like that James Harden used to really excel at that when he played for the the Warriors. He was their scorer and he would be – what? What, Ian? James Rocket. Harden, you said the Rockets? Oh, the Thunder. The Thunder. The Thunder, the Thunder. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he really excelled at, all right, James – you're now the man for the six minutes that we have mostly reserves in there with you go crazy. You know, if we score 20 points, we want you to score 17 of them. Right. I think you have to have a similar staggering when you do rotations in football, you can't do this. Let's put out a new seven guys on the field all together. I think you have to stagger it a little better. Um, you know, on, on our D line, frankly, I think we're going to have the ability to just put out different types of guys. And it's not necessarily that they're better or worse than the other guy, the starter uh, against a certain opponent. Trey Moore is a better player than Baron Sorrell against a certain type of opponent. Sorrell is a better player. And so you That's can, you can stagger that appropriately, but I agree with you guys. Let's not roll out seven new guys all at once on the third drive of the game. Let's bleed them in three on the second, three on the you know the third, two on the fourth, and then all the starters finish out the half, right? I mean, that's that's kind of what you want to aim for. And it also helps if one guy gets hurt, he's played enough staggered with some of these other guys. There's still a little bit of consistency. They 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 know each other still a little bit better because they've been on the field with each other. You know, you yep. think of depth as an absolute strength, and and I, I, I'm guilty of that. That's a strength. That's what you strive for in your program. But there actually are limitations to depth. And and, and Paul made a great, great point, you know, when we talked about this. And please go to InsideTexas.com. We're running a special IT1, two months for a dollar. Read that story that Paul posted in depth on depth. I mean, the man is brilliant. You got to check it out. Tell me what you think are limitations, because I was a little hesitant at first. But – it, you, 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 as usual, you started making some sense. What are the limitations there of having too much depth? Well, so the, the limitations in terms of chemistry or roster management, that's one issue. I can't okay. really address that. I suspect Sark will do the best he can. I think we have one of the best coaches in the country in addressing that because he's a clear communicator. He doesn't play favorites. You know, if you win the job, you win the job. And I think people understand that. Yeah. Uh, so that I can't really address. I just generally, I think Texas will do pretty well in that regard, the chemistry issues. The other part is depth is a lot of floor. And what it makes your team is very resilient and durable. And I don't just mean withstanding injury, but I mean, if you can play a lot of people through the course of a game, you can weather those off games because you're going to be coming strong at the end, in the, in the fourth quarter, Right. And if the game's going a little sideways on you, having guys with some extra juice in their legs to close it out is very helpful. And I think that's a big advantage. But here's the disadvantage of depth. And it's not a disadvantage. It's just a limitation of having too much depth. Okay. If it's a one-point game and there's a minute left on the clock, you're 11 out there or you're 11. It doesn't matter the theoretical waves of depth you have behind them. The 11 guys out on the field are going to determine that game in that instant. Okay. The second part is ultimately you're going to win the national championship or advance deep in the playoffs based on your stars and your depth. So you better have depth in a world where you, you're going to play 15 or 16 games if you're going to play for the title. Right. But at the same time, you better have some stars. <laughs> it's not enough just to have. 45 pretty good players on your roster that are there constantly you rotated. Your ceiling is ultimately going to be Quinn Ewers playing like a freaking Heisman guy who's who's getting invited up to New York, right? Your ceiling is going to be Isaiah Bond dropping 1,300 yards instead of 750. Your ceiling is going to be Jaden Blue 
averaging seven yards a carry instead of five. <laughs> That's ultimately the limitation of depth. You always want depth, but ultimately your stars are going to be the guys that elevate you. The Washington Huskies look no further. They had a lot of role players and then some really, really good players who presented a problem for you combined with a you know fairly genius coach. So uh, you want to combine all these things and, and ultimately that's how you're, you're going to, you're going to reach the promised land. Washington's such a good example too, because the depth is often for the playoffs. The depth is often your floor. And they, they had the floor drop out a little bit when their running back was really badly beat up in the Michigan game. And they didn't have another option because they had already lost a bunch of guys. That's, that's where depth will really save you when it's like, and this is kind of the concern for some of the smaller schools when they get into this expanded playoff is maybe you have like a Washington type team where you got a few stars that can play with anybody. And then you have good role players up and down, but then you lose your free safety and the backup is not up for it at the playoff level. And then you have this huge glaring hole that everyone exploits. But uh, one other, one other limitation of depth could be, your development can be a little bit different when you have guys that you know you're counting on and they know you're counting on them. Like you get like the, you know, sunshine and remember the Titans when uh, coach coach sends them out and he's like, I had 12 brothers and it was all on me. You know, this whole thing is going to come down if you can't be a big brother for your team and make the option pitch, whatever it was and remember the Titans. Did you see that movie, Paul? You're looking at me with the, the most vacant expression. I, I did see it. I'm just curious with how you're going on this. I, I got it. Yeah, I am too because I think he lied. So uh, yeah, 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 that's yeah. a limitation of coaching, lying to your players. But okay. it motivated him at the time because Sunshine made that pitch. The point is, is that Sunshine emerges there because he knows he has to. Like if I, if I can't get this done, everything craters on this team. I let everybody down, right? That has a big impact on a young dude. Whereas if he's like, he's like one of four guys that could play the position, how much, how sharp is he going to be? Right. And it, for a lot of guys, that doesn't matter. But if it's a potential star like Sunshine, you really want him to feel like he needs to be great for the team to be great. And, and then just the other point, like how much attention can you give a kid like uh, to, to pull from another season one of, uh, of uh, Friday Night Lights? How good would Matt Sarah have been if coach wasn't like, okay, I got to turn this kid into a star quarterback because we just lost our dude. Yep. Like Sarah was not getting the late night practice sessions. If the other dude whose name I don't remember hadn't gotten crippled or whatever the heck happened. So you, you, you guys following me? Yes. I, I, I'm following you. I'm following you. you. You went pop culture on us in this last segment and, and it was fantastic to be honest with you. Uh, any parting shots, guys? Because this was this was so much better. This was great. I love this. This was in depth, on depth, the pros and the cons. Any parting shots, gentlemen? I want to bring in the movie Hoosiers. So when Ollie yes. goes to the free throw line, and no, go ahead. Let's close. It oh off. man, you were okay. so close. You could have landed. This is where this is the movie that we should have referenced in in regards to depth. Wildcats, oh. Goldie Hawn. Getting Lavander Bird, the few Vince Young before Vince Young, getting him to come down, stop selling wash, watches, slinging counterfeit goods, and get him to come down and become part of the team, and then moving Woody Harrelson to the slot. Guys, that was that's how Goldie Hawn showed us the template for how we're supposed to use depth, and I think that movie is unbelievable. You got to check that out. That's such, such a good movie. Please tell me you guys have seen that. Of course. Well, and the big fat kid was the first NIL kid. He would only pay. He would only play hard if you gave him money. That's that's what we do it inside Texas. It's full circle. We that's always right. bring it up. Paul and Ian, I sure do appreciate you guys today. This was absolutely a blast. Thank you for the viewers for watching this. Thank you. Thank you for making us a part of your day. And, and check us out over at InsideTexas.com. Uh, Coming up tonight, we're going to have a live stream, so be sure and, and tune in to that at ten o'clock or seven o'clock Central Time uh, for Justin Wells, Ian Boyd, and Paul Waddlington. This is the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel, powered by InsideTexas.com.